I'm happy to be on this. It's uh, I've been listening to you all. I I um, listen to podcasts in the morning when I go for what I claim is a run, but it's actually more <laughs> of a walk and a run. And uh, podcasts keep me fueled. Uh, and I've been enjoying listening to yours. So thank you for doing this, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I so I grew up in I was uh, born and grew up in Evanston, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago. It's where the University of Northwestern is based um, and where my father taught. And so um, that's where I grew up. Hmm. In terms of where I'm, I overlapped with architecture or sort of got interested in architecture, I fear that this story has been told a lot. So it won't be very fresh to a lot of people. <laughs> but I, um, so in eighth grade, my, my twin brother and I were in the school where my mother t taught a small, pri very, very small private school. And our eighth grade English teacher assigned everyone a paper to understand a, a profession or a, a future, a career, I guess you could say. And um, Alex, my, my brother, looked at law and I looked at architecture, but I looked at, um, I did it as a division where I wrote a 10 page history of architecture. I've managed to con con, you know, convey the entire history of architecture in 10 pages. Wow. And then I interviewed an architect who was uh, practicing in Evanston. And so um, Alex has become a lawyer. He's um, uh, catching bad guys in The Hague. Hmm. And um, I, I actually think what's funny is that people say, oh, so you knew you wanted to be an architect. But actually, I think it's it, it's remarkable how prescient that assignment was because in the end, I have combined continuing doing history and theory and writing, obviously, um, but also an interest in practice and so and an engagement in, in practice with our office. And so um, it's not that I was attracted immediately to become an architect myself, but I was my first my first taste and I would say my first foray was into the culture of architecture. And I think that really sort of characterizes um, where I where I started. That's interesting. But why as an eighth grader were you interested in architecture? Were your parents designers or architects or? or... Not at all. No. So my parents were both um, uh, humanists. So my father taught French literature and my mother taught French language. And um, we came from a family that was decidedly all arts and arts and humanities. Um, no, I, I was interested in, and I still am interested in, I would say still the reason why I find architecture such a wonderful field is I'm interested in how people uh, come together, how they get along in mm. the world. And um, in the end, the built environment shapes how people uh, interact collectively. And so it's a sort of, I would say it's a sort of spatial and formal, it's the instantiation of political science mm. or social social politics. That's a great description of, of architecture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, but as an eighth grader, so you wrote a 10 page uh, paper that that summarized the entire history of architecture. Oh, yeah. I, I, I should look. I have no idea if I still have that paper. I'd be curious what it said. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, ten pages is a, is a long. That's long for an eighth grader. I guess yeah. depending on the eighth grader. I guess you got inspired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so from that point, um, you did undergrad in architecture, right? So did you? No. No. I I, I made up a major um, because <laughs> I um, so I I I thought I wanted to do art history. Um, it's what my sister did, and it was the closest I got to what architecture was from my family's orientation. Hmm. And then I realized I'm not very good at memorizing slides. And <laughs> and I got interested in a bunch of different classes. And um, and so I made up a major, um, which you could do. It's, it was called a special divisional major. You had to define, you had to have two advisors at all times and, and define your own course tra trajectory. And the problem, so it makes it sound like I really knew what I wanted to do and I was really organized and self-motivated. In fact, it was because I was interested in so many things I couldn't make up my mind. Mm. And um, this was my way of, of taking care of that. And the problem with it is that I would choose two advisors and they would promptly get some amazing grant and leave for the year. Oh. And so it kept shifting. So it started with American environmental history with Bill Cronin 
who remains really a, an amazing model for me. He's now teaching at um, the University of Wisconsin. He wrote Nature's Metropolis, which is a fantastic history of uh, Chicago and, and its relationship to materials. And and then he got, a, I think he got a MacArthur. And so it, it kept shifting. So it essentially, I, I got an amazing exposure to a lot of things. It ended up being a combination of architecture, art history, philosophy, and history. I didn't know you could make up your own major or, or go down that path at Yale. Um, that's pretty intriguing. So were you still required to do GEs and things like that? Oh, yeah, you have. I mean, they, they have a structure where you have to do a certain um, you had to fulfill certain distribution requirements. And so I still did have to do a certain degree of, of science and math, which is not my, as I said, <laughs> not my family strength. I married into a family of engineers, so I feel like I fulfilled all that through marriage. <laughs> um, I so uh, yeah, you, you know, it's a small a small major of independent majors there, but most universities allow that. Mm. Um, the other thing that I think really influenced me is uh, while I was at Yale, I was um, a, an editor of the arts of the newspaper. Of, I was one of the two arts editors of the Yale Daily News. And that to me was uh, as formative as any course in my education and in my formation was editing and having to write for a daily newspaper. And um, so when I, I, what I was aiming at, what I wanted to do was become a, an architecture critic for a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And and so I graduated, and as I was going close to graduation, I wrote all the newspapers and magazines, and most of my colleagues at the newspaper were getting great uh, jobs with newspapers because it's a the the Daily News is a great college paper. And at this point, there were no there were no open jobs for architecture critics. It's not <laughs> like there were very many, and there are even fewer now. And so I was getting really close to graduation. I was discovering that this was not a, a very fulfilling career path or a very <laughs> promising one. Um, and a friend of mine uh, had worked for Peter Eisenman years before, or his sister had worked for Eisenman. And I met her and she said, oh, you, you should talk to Peter about the job that he hires someone, a new person every year to essentially be his assistant. And that's uh, the job I ended up landing out of out of school. No, that's wow. a pretty cool that's position. That's pretty amazing. So yeah. I, I think it's interesting that you you were the editor or you're the writer for that newspaper. So what things did you learn from that experience? Like anything specific? Is it is it because oh, yeah. you have to do it so often and um, you know produce content very often? Was that the? It's an amazing training to have to write uh, short and write clear and <laughs> and write frequently, but also actually editing other people's writing was so because you know I wrote to get to that position and then when you're the actual editor you're you're editing other you're writing some but you're also editing other people's it also was a, a an education in forming opinions because the arts editor is doing criticisms so I was writing criticism of theater and um, painting and and architecture and I think that for me, that is you know, very, very important to learn how to edit writing and, and the importance and cl of clear communication is is just very dear to me. So, yeah. So is editing somebody else's writing about those different kinds of fields, does that require having a knowledge just about writing or do you also have to have some kind of backgrounds in those fields? No, it's a good question. I mean, I would say it's a little bit, and I'm, I'm trying to compare it to to architecture. So if you're teaching architecture, we, we, you know, if you're doing studio criticism, if you're teaching studio, you don't have to have an expertise in the program necessarily. You know, you're not, you, you didn't commission a library, but you can teach a student how to do a library. And it's a sort of similar thing. You know enough about, I mean, I probably should have known more about some of the fields I was um, writing about, probably. Um, but I did, I, my father also taught uh, modern drama, so I actually had a lot of training in theater, um, understanding theater through literature, at least. And mm -hmm. so, um, and uh, so I, it's not like, I, for example, I never wrote about music because I'm hopeless with, with <laughs> any intelligence on that front. And so I think, it, but but I think it, it is sort of akin to teaching studio as is, is um, 
knowing enough about a field, but also knowing how to make it better. And it is through the writing in the same way that, you know, form and space and teaching a studio and organization mm. and program and uh, materials are things that we know um, no matter what the program is or the site. Right? Yeah. yeah. It, it does, yeah. it makes me think that one of the interesting things, I suppose, about interesting things about being an architecture teacher or a critic at a review, and by extension, maybe also an editor in, in writing, is you're you're meant to enhance and improve, but not not take over the piece. <laughs> right. It's not your yeah. piece. There's a personality yeah. of the creator that needs to be kind of retained. I think that's really true and very important, and um, and it is similar to teaching studio. You know, I think I think the best studio critics are ones where they let the student um, develop their own voice um, while still making sure that it's not everything goes or anything goes is the expression. So yeah. um, it's a very similar thing. Interesting. So yeah. <clears throat> at Yale, did you take any architecture studio courses or was it? <laughs> I took one. I took um, the sophomore studio um, was the only, that was the only studio I, I took. Um, otherwise I was taking mostly uh, humanities classes. And so then, after you finished that, was there a break between your time at Yale and then you you getting a master's at Princeton? Yeah, so there was a year where I was working for Eisenman in gotcha. New York, and that I I, I credit Peter largely with um, pushing me to apply to master's programs in in architecture because I was thinking, okay, I'll, I'll head right into a PhD program. I knew I wanted to teach, hmm. and I thought, okay, I, I want to teach history and theory. That's my my formation. And um, he taught me how to draw, I think, you know, more than my studio had. And um, I also worked on making models. I was his assistant during the day, which meant I did everything from edit his writing to uh, feed his cat when he was away. So it was like, you know, it was completely big, open job. And then off hours, I would work at, um, so I, I worked on some of the drawings for the Tarani book where it was literally just learning how to do ink on mylar, very sharp corners, and um, <laughs> it, was, it was a repetitive, and it was it was really helpful to me. And so um, he exposed me to to design. He also, I mean, I think he challenges everyone who works for him or studies with him. I never studied with him, but I, I worked for him, and he he constantly challenged me to have opinions about what was going on in the office. And so it was an incredibly stimulating place, really smart people there. So Greg Lynn was there oh. um, and other people. And um, so again, he convinced me to apply to schools. And, and yes, that's what's fascinating about studying architecture as a graduate student in the US is that you can enter into this field without much background um into these m arc one programs the three and a half year or three year programs and you can come from the liberal arts and as long as you can show that you have some hand and some brain um they are willing to help form you but it means that a that kind of master's program unlike what you did david is uh very intense because you're getting you're going from zero to 60 very quickly in three <laughs> yeah. years yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i've mostly mostly taught um undergrad students and on occasion i'll sit in a reviews and whatnot for m mark one program students mm -hmm. and i'm blown away by the idea of how quickly they have to learn things if they come i mean you had yeah. a you had a background in architecture and you'd worked for eisman so you had as you said some skills and whatever but some folks transition and they have very very little and yeah. um it's impressive pretty little, to be honest <laughs> i mean i had exposure and i knew what architecture culture was but i did not I, I don't have a natural hand and so it was quite a steep learning curve to to learn and and structures boy that was hard <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me ask you eisenman as far as i know he was always located in new york city so during that year was that in, in new york or is that it was in new york yeah yeah okay, yeah cool. gotcha cool so you've been you've been on the east coast this entire time <laughs> uh well no because after princeton um i went to rotterdam and worked for oma for a oh, couple right. Of years right, right, right. and um and and ron joined me there so we were there in europe and then from there, we came back, I went to MIT, and he went to Florida, as I said. And after my two years of coursework, I went down to Florida and joined him, started teaching 
um, I taught my first class there was a, a seminar on um, uh, uh, critical metropolitanism. Um, and uh, I was, I then took my, I did my exams by fax there. So something I don't recommend to PhD students to follow my model because I think I didn't take enough advantage of my time at MIT. I went through it pretty quickly. I finished my coursework as fast as I could and then and then left hmm. and did everything else remotely, as it were. And I think um, I got a lot of teaching experience as a result, but I think I, I missed out on the important um, moment of really uh, disappearing into your work, which the PhD students really should do. Mm. So a question mm -hmm. regarding that, how long did it take you to, to get the, the doctor of philosophy? Um, because I, I've come across a few PhD students. First of all, I have to say that they're so hardcore. Like if you think master's degree students are hardcore, like PhD students are at another level. And sometimes it takes them like five or six years. Or longer. Or um, <laughs> so I, it took me 10 years and okay. that's because, or actually was it was at 10 or nine um it was nine but it it was because i was i was teaching um starting my third year so we we i that third year i went to and joined ron in florida it was his third year of being there as an assistant professor and we moved from there to the university of kentucky where we taught for three years i was an adjunct and ron was an assistant professor there and um, so I, you know, when you spend that much time teaching, and I was also doing a lot of editing during that time, I was the um, opinions editor, not the opinions editor, That's a, that should be taken out. I was the reviews editor for Assemblage, but I kind of treated it like an op-ed page. Mm -hmm. And um, I also did, uh, I edited the Ignacy Solo Morales book for the writing architecture series. So I was doing still a lot of freelance editing and um, writing uh, aside from the PhD and teaching. So it took me a long time. I see. I see. I, I see what you're saying now, as opposed to being fully absorbed just in your mm -hmm. own internal studies. Right. Yeah. Um, when you were at Princeton getting your master's, I assume you took like architecture studio right like design studio oh, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. A, that was a design degree yeah. yeah 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 so what was that like because maybe perhaps prior to that you you hadn't done a lot of that kind of work was it a big jump to be into a design studio and to do that zero to 60 mile per hour like you were talking about yeah i mean my whole class was in that circumstance and it's a very very small program it was extremely small at the time so our class was six people mm. And we were joined in our second year by four people, all of whom came from UVA, if I remember correctly, um, who were in the advanced track, right? And so the six of us actually, out of the six of us, I think two had majored in architecture as undergraduates, one from Princeton, one from Yale, and, and then the others of us were sort of really just newbies to this field. It was hard. It was admittedly hard. And and I admire the patience of my faculty who were teaching me. And and I often I, I do think of students here um, and everywhere else I've taught who are uh, new to architecture because you do have to remember how new that is. And um, at the same time, it's it's so exciting as a field because unlike unlike uh, typical humanities where you're writing a paper, you hand it into your faculty member, your professor, and they hand it back to you. And it's all a very one-on-one -on -one thing. The studio is this collaborative thing where you're learning from your classmates, you're watching what other people do and picking up skills. You're, it's a lot of it is done through discussion. You, you a project is the intersection of thinking about architecture um, thinking about culture, thinking about society, but also knowing the technical things, um, and then knowing how to represent it. I, I think it's just an extraordinary synthesis. Mm. And so as an education, it was very liberating, actually. And, and so that part was just, and it was, we had a great group of people at Princeton at that time. It was, it was a very, very exciting time to be there. You know, I think it's a great description. And that's something that Marina and I kind of talk about pretty often is, <laughs> you know, why why do a lot of architects have so much passion for this profession? I think you you described it beautifully because it's almost a never ending and a continually um, evolving problem to kind of wrestle with and solve because it's at the intersection of all the things you mentioned and it's 
it's kind of a mind boggle <laughs> if I think about it too much, you know, all the things that are at play. It's amazing. Um, you know, it really does bring so many different things together. And when you when you think about it, if you think about it too much, you wonder how the hell does anything get built, right? <laughs> if you start to introduce policy and um, zoning and then the you know OSHA and, and uh, you know health safety structures, what holds something up, the cost of things, it's amazing. And so I find it so remarkably exciting when you look around and see what gets built and how how it changes the world around it i mean that's it to me it is a, a sort of remarkable thing and so yeah that's i and i think uh teaching architecture there's nothing more fun right i mean it's it's it is amazing to uh, have that opportunity to think about these problems and to be a little bit separate from the challenges of real practice mm -hmm. but i think to try and always keep those in mind so that you're not so separate from real practice that you um live in la la land yeah yeah and that's a tricky balance to find mm -hmm. i think i think it, it's very challenging you know there's one question that it came to mind that we get asked fairly often um from listeners and students is whether or not someone should, this is a bit of a tangent, I suppose, but whether or not someone should go and get a master's in architecture. And I guess there's two different categories of people. There's folks who are, would be on the MARC one track. So people who don't have a degree in architecture. And then there's also people who do. And um, I suppose I would ask that question to you, if you have any thoughts of what things someone should consider um, if they're trying to make that decision. So if you don't have uh, any background or if you have a a BS in architecture or a BA in architecture, um, you need to get a master's in order to get licensed, right? And mm -hmm. so um, if you want to practice uh, and be licensed, and, and I encourage that, that's why you would want to get uh, get a, a, a master's of architecture. I think the, the group of people who um, are a very different category are the people who have a first professional degree. So you went to Cal Poly, you have a five-year degree. You don't. You didn't need to. There's no reason for you to get an, a master's of any sort, mm. unless you want to teach, um, or unless you want to further your education, which I think is always a good thing. I'm obviously <laughs> pretty invested in education. I think it's a fabulous world to be in. And so, I think I think it's it's a question that really depends on the specific person asking it. And um, uh, but I do I do think that. For the most part, it's it is a very useful um, degree to get. But it, it, what's fascinating about the master's programs is precisely the different kinds of experiences that are brought together, and that's precisely why it's helpful as a student to realize that instead of being afraid of the fact that you don't know the same things as the person sitting next to you, it's a huge advantage mm. to put all that on the open and learn from each other because you each come with different strengths. Mm. Uh, and again, it's that's different from, I say, a master's program in math or a master's program in English or history where it's it's more individualized work and you would be very anxious once you heard that you know all your colleagues had a certain experience that you didn't have. Here, I think it's actually uh, an advantage to come in with a certain kind of experience. That's an interesting uh, perspective to have on it. It makes a lot of sense because I, I think one way also to look at the different degrees <clears throat> as a person is advancing is that typically you assume that that individual is becoming more focused in whatever they're studying, which is generally the case. You know, maybe in, in a, at a uh, undergraduate level, you have a vague understanding or a general sense of architecture, and then as you move forward into masters and PhD, you kind of begin to focus on something you're interested in. But you're totally right that. When you get to graduate school, you're injected with all these, <clears throat> first of all, much older <laughs> adults you're surrounded by that are grad students and all, from all different backgrounds. And and I mean, so the the key, and I, ta I, I give a little orientation shtick at the beginning of every year, the key is recognizing that even, even if three and a half years for the MR1 students coming in, say, here at Harvard, even if that sounds long, it goes by really fast. And so um, you should, even if the field is relatively new to you for that group of students, you have to be pretty focused and considered in what you're taking as classes. So they're obviously required classes, but 
you shape your world through what electives you add to those requirements or how you take the requirements and, and put your own stamp on them. And I think that's what's exciting. I mean, I love teaching undergraduates. Here, obviously, we only have graduate students. We have a small program with the college for undergraduates that we're trying to expand. But we really focus, it's, it's a graduate school of design. And the plus side of that is, you know, as I say to students, you should know why you're here and you should know what you're aiming at. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty exciting because you're dealing with people who are, you know, they may still be learning the skills, but they have the intelligence to sort of aim at something. Yeah, I, I do remember that. And I also remember, you know, not having to take any more structures courses or <laughs> chemistry <It> was pretty <laughs> exciting. <laughs> So did you did you always knew that you wanted to teach architecture? I didn't know I always wanted to teach architecture. I sort of, I mean, I, it, it just shows I'm not that rebellious a kid. Um, so my, I came from an academic family. I grew up, you know, spending weekends on the campus, right? And so we we it's a very comfortable mm -hmm. environment. And, and all of my siblings now we're all attached to universities, and so um, it's a it. And 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 I do think it's a very luxurious career. It's hard. I do I do think actually, academia is not easy. Um, but at the same time, there's a sort of luxurious quality to it because you're constantly learning, and um, and you're also constantly surrounded by people who want to be learning. And and you know, the students are really extraordinary here, and they get me very excited about different topics or, or different angles of seeing the world. And that's very stimulating as an environment to be part of. And so I'm not surprised, I can't say I ever consciously thought, oh yeah, I wanna be mm -hmm. uh, in academia. I certainly never thought, oh yeah, I wanna grow up and be a dean. Who the hell <laughs> that? Um, but, I, but I do think that it's a very comfortable environment. So it's somewhat natural that all four of us found ourselves tied to academia in some way. That's funny. We uh, not long ago had a conversation about the differences between architecture practice and architecture school. And one of them is sort of what you described, um, or the being in the academic space is what you described as being luxurious. And you're surrounded by this, this culture and this energy and th the thirst to learn. And yeah. I find that sometimes when people transition to practicing in a professional setting, that can kind of dissipate, depending on where you're practicing, obviously. But that can go away very quickly uh, if you're not at the right and place. And depending where you went to school, I mm -hmm. think. Um, so that's one of the things that drew me back to the GSD is it's a it's a school that has always been very clearly, uh, uh, let's say, has always respected practice, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, it. It is, if, if you've read Harry Cobb's little book, um, Words and Works, I think it's called, it, that captures his moment at the GSD and, and I think captures the quality of this school that has, as I say, a respect for practice. And I think that's very exciting because I, I do think the architectural academia is extraordinary. Um, it, you know, as I said, it's fun, it's synthetic, it's exciting. I think practice is also extraordinary it's synthetic it's hard because of all the restraints that are put on it but i think that if you if in school you have exposure to practice but also if you can be thinking how can we be constantly improving practice then you're in a, a pretty amazing position to step into and 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 bring practice forward as mm -hmm. opposed to practice always being beholden to the pressures on it and and so, for example, here at the GSD last Saturday, there was a, a what was called a practice plenary. It was a symposium that was put on by the people who teach practice in in the different departments. So um, Jacob Rydell in the architecture department, Elizabeth Christopher uh Paolo Sturla and and uh, Karen uh, Janowski in in landscape, and they they brought together different voices to look at issues of practice within you know jeffrey burchard greg garminza i mean it was a really good group of faculty who deal with practice in the curriculum here um uh, who who for their students had a collection of people looking at at pra issues of practice around the question of those little restaurant huts in new york that got on the streets and now what do you do right 
And so it's a practice question that deals with urbanism, with planning, with architecture, with materials. And and they had a three hour um, big Zoom that, on a Saturday morning. And I thought that's amazing, right? To get this, to for practice to be um, driving uh, that big a conversation and across the disciplines, across the departments, uh, and and demonstrating that that we can't we can't turn our back on practice when we're in school. We we have to actually figure out how to both embrace it and, as I said, push it forward. Yeah, I mean, I definitely understand that there probably needs to be some institutions and people who are deep diving into the architectural i call it kind of architecture research or the theory of things which are is maybe even the furthest away let's say from practice but i think also what you're saying makes total sense and um i think also now that we have our own office you begin to realize the challenges of it and and i think it's also a larger question for the profession because being an architect frankly is not very lucrative for most architects and yeah. it's 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 another that's one piece of the pie that probably can't be ignored is is what is that what does that mean for everything and and i would argue that even if you are interested in history theory uh practice shouldn't be so divorced from what you're doing i think mm. this is where again i i really pay tribute to eisenman for saying if you want to have a career where you're writing about architecture, whether for a newspaper or for an academic world, if you don't know how to draw a plan, if you've never really dealt with you know, the, the material questions of how something comes together, this is Peter saying this, then you're, you, you, know, you, you are divorced from really understanding how to write about architecture. Hmm. And I think so. I, I think it's very important to have that um, combination, and and for um, understanding that it's it shouldn't be such a, a divided world. The writing about architecture, or the the thinking about architecture, and the practice of architecture. Do you feel like that maybe those two things have become more divided in recent years? No, I think they've always been. They've always been partially divided, and there've always been some people who have brought them together in amazing mm -hmm. ways, right? I mean, um, Ken Frampton was trained as an architect, and I think you can tell that through the way he writes about architecture. Robin Evans, who I think was one of the most extraordinary writers about architecture, taken away too young, was you know trained as an architect, and I, I think that um, combination is is amazing. I think there are some people who can. Uh, can write about architecture without the training. And there are some people who write about architecture with the training who are no good, right? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like it's a guarantee either, but I think that it's, um, I think historically uh, it is, it, it, there's always been some people who are isolated from practice who write, there are other people who have been quite tied to it. So I, I don't think it's particularly different at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, <laughs> so on the the subject of practice, do you have any guesses or senses of what the future of architecture practice might be? <laughs> That's a small question. <laughs> I, I know, right? No That's pressure. a teeny one. I I think we're going to see continue seeing a lot of the things that we've already seen evolve. I think, um, and here I would I would actually. Um, I would, I would point you to another podcast, which is Grace Law's uh, practice podcast that she has through the school. And I would point you particularly to the episode with Hanif Kara. Um, oh, no, not with Hanif. That's a good one, too. But with um, Paul Nakazawa. Mm. So listen to Paul Nakazawa on Grace Law's Talking Practice podcast, because Paul, who um, was a he was also trained as an architect. Um, he uh, has he he has advised practices over the years. He's a, uh, I don't know what you would call his. I'm sure if I if I looked, you would have a good way of capturing his title or what how he how he um, captured himself. But but Paul essentially lays out the he he's very good at advising offices that are growing mm -hmm. and he characterizes, you know, the five person office, the 10, 12 person office, 15 people, and and then the 200 person office. 
and that there is a very difficult land in between. And that um, so sort of the advice of being conscious of how one one grows. And I think more and more, so this is a long way of, and convoluted way of getting to an answer to your question, that if you, um, I think where I see practice going, I think it will continue to be dividing into smaller practices and very large practices with less and less in between. Hmm. Partly because the in-between has the challenge of keeping the office fed and keeping going, um, paying for the insurance and everything like that. And that's a very hard uh, line to keep balancing. And so it's easier to have a very, very big practice where you have big teams and, and you're constantly absorbing big projects or a smaller practice that can be somewhat nimble. Mm. So I think that's one thing. I, whether one could parallel that with the disappearing middle class, I think that would be a really interesting article. Um, so <laughs> mm. Think about that. I might write that someday because I think that's happening in America, right? We have um, yeah, that's the for middle, sure true, right? Yeah. So, so that's one thing. I think that we'll see practice further dividing into very small and very large. And then the other thing is, I think the continued uh, nimbleness of collaborations, of of pairing with other offices or pairing with areas of expertise of recognizing that architects who are synthetic and who are generalists don't need to have the expertise all over the place. In a way, they're like um, you know, Legos or plug-in toys where you can plug into what you need for a certain project by plugging into that expertise. So, you know, facade specialists um, or, um, you know, MEP specialists, but you don't, you, you just need the level to be able to communicate with those people and the designer remains synthetic and can remain a smaller office. So hmm. um, that's that's what I see, I think. That's interesting. That last point is, is really fascinating because um, I think it's natural for that to occur, or it almost has to occur that way because so many professions are becoming super specialized, like the facade right. designer you were describing. Right. Um, and we were discussing the other day that artists are kind of interesting folks because they have innately the the role that you're describing where they so if i'm a sculptor and an artist and i go to design a table and then i jump to doing a mural then it does you jump to designing a house everyone knows i'm not an expert at you know, any of those things i don't have let's say even the pressure of being an expert that's not my job that's not my value at all right. and right. um i don't know what that means for us exactly but it, but it seems perhaps somewhat parallel to what you're saying yeah no i think so <laughs> Uh, you know, before we were talking about different uh, degrees in the education system and uh, folks kind of developing a focus or an interest when they get to the master's level. For you, did you have an interest? Um, like when you did your, your, your doctoral thesis, was it on a particular thing? Yeah. So, um, uh, first of all, I'm already doing my master's, I had an interest. So, um, uh, Greg Lynn at Mitchell and I, um, edited an issue of the Princeton Journal. In fact, I think I think we killed off the Princeton Journal. I think there wasn't any issue after that, the Princeton Architecture <laughs> Journal. So we did the the issue the fourth issue, which was called Fetish. So I knew, you know, already at Princeton, which was also a choice of a school that was um permeating history theory, I knew that I was interested in in again, you know, learning design, but learning it while being in a environment that was focusing also on history and theory. Um, in terms of my doctoral work, um, I came in with, you You have to write a prospectus when you apply to doctoral programs. And my prospectus was on big projects in, in urban sites because I'm, I've always been interested in things that don't fit into a city grid. So, you know, mm. urban parks, for example, if you think of Central Park or if you think of the parks in Paris, which was what I was looking at, they, they're too big to really fit, and they rearrange the city as, as the city grows around them, but as they also are inserted in the city or think of stadium projects that are in cities, they're too big, mm -hmm. right? So that's that was what I was coming in. So it's a, an interest in sort of, uh, let's say, big projects that affect urbanism. I ended up right. I mean, you, you almost never stick to your original proposal, and I ended up... Um, working on the topic of when uh, when let's say um, um, America kind of took the international stage uh, with World War II 
um, how uh, how that changed uh, American architecture and urbanism, and so how there developed a civic language of architecture here. You saw that that moment in the 40s and 50s, a transition from uh, uh, post offices and and um, city halls that were temples into modern architecture. Right, the beginnings of kind of using a modern language to talk about a civic realm, and so it. It was my dissertation um, was on that topic first. The, the first chapter looked at the discussion of modernism and monumentality mm. as a discourse and all the debates and articles about it. The second chapter was on the type of the civic building in America. And then the, the third was on a, a city, a, a part of a city that was transformed during this period. And it was looking at the area around IIT. So that how that institution sort of um, uh, suggested a kind of urban plan through the urban development that happened around um, IIT and then from 1945 to 1960. Um, I, I think the dissertation was 1937 to 1958, which was the period when Mies was actually at IIT. Huh. Um, and, and I think uh, was a very transformative period for um, American architecture. Do you think that your interest in architectural issues more at the urban scale, is that tied to your interest? And the very beginning, you were saying an interest in people and how people kind of interact and things like that, as opposed to perhaps it's hard to draw delineations between architecture and urban design, I feel. But but for, let's say for the sake of conversation that, you know, an interest in urban issues as opposed to I'm just interested in building facades. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm definitely interested in, so in the the buildings I'm most interested in are public buildings where different populations intersect and have to work with a building. But um, I'm definitely interested in, in where populations come together or people come together. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a good way of capturing it. Yeah. I've always felt for myself, because obviously, as I mentioned prior, my master's is in urban design, therefore I have an interest in it. Oh. And I, I have a, if I were to design my own school, <laughs> I think some urban design courses would be in, in embedded within the architectural education. I, I don't. I feel like it's difficult to study architecture, understand it, without without that. Yeah. So at Rice, I mean, I think you know the the pleasure we had of, of being at Rice for nine and a half years was that was a school that where it was a one department school. It was just architecture, but architecture decidedly in an urban context, in part sort of embracing Houston. Uh, which is such a, a 21st century city, frankly, you know, certainly a late 20th century city. So um, I, I absolutely agree that. And, and that's also one of the things that's, a, again, a pleasure about coming back here to the GSD is that you have the three departments and the where they intersect. So all the courses here are departmental only for the required courses. Uh, within the discipline, so the courses that you need to take for accreditation. But once you hit your electives, the courses aren't listed by department. They're listed just by number. And so they're, the idea is that they're open to anyone in the school and you have at your advanced courses, your option studios and your elective courses, you, in, you interact with students in the three programs. So from landscape, from urban planning and design and from architecture. And to me, that's super exciting to see that because I think that's going back to your question about practice. That's what we um, that's what we see. You know, that's what practice is, is you you need to work with those other fields. It's mm. you're not isolated in your own box. Right. And we talk about that actually fairly often, because when I studied in France, my my undergrad, we would have, um, you know, like studio architecture history and then urban studies types of classes and sociology mm. and actually understanding, you know, population, people, patterns, their behavior in spaces was I think was very informative. It would probably was pretty much on the surface at that level, but I think it was pretty informative, even in an undergrad um, mm -hmm. degree, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of just, just be aware, just put that on the radar and just keep thinking about those, those things as you design. Exactly. Yeah. So talking about Harvard and the GSD, I mean, anyone in the United States knows of the school, they know of the trays, they know of the, the building. Um, but maybe for folks who are abroad, and we have a fair amount of those listeners, um, 
you're like, how many people fit in that building? <laughs> so, so, a... I mean, even even people in the U.S. may not know the building. So Gund Hall, which is the building I'm in right now, um, and which turns 50 next fall, which is pretty exciting. Gund Hall was designed by John Andrews um, in 1972, or, or built, finished in 1972. So it this is a building where you have essentially around 630 students <laughs> in a space that is um, called the trays, and it's a series of mezzanines in one big space with a, uh, a sloped glass roof that um, allows you to, at a glance, see you know, <laughs> 629 other people, right? Um, it's, it is, I remember when I first came here, um, it, it, it's, it's, you feel like an ant, you know, you feel, or a, <laughs> or a cockroach in a New York apartment when they turn on the light and you suddenly feel completely <laughs> exposed. And then you realize pretty quickly that on the one hand, everyone is exposed. On the other hand, it's such a sea of people that you're not really, you're not really that visible as an individual, a sea of people. But the, so all the studios are in the trays, except now the school has gotten too big for its, its building. So we actually have, um, uh, four studios in a building next door that was done by Jim Sterling. Hmm. Um, we call 485 Broadway. It has an official name that we don't use. Um, and uh, but the the trays are an extraordinary. It's it's an extraordinary building for an architecture school because you get this mix. It's all the students in the different programs are in there, and so you get a mix of uh, the different disciplines, the three departments. And um, you can be sitting in an architecture studio and be right next door to a landscape studio. And I think that's really good for the students to get exposed to um, one another that way. You mentioned that there is an undergraduate program, albeit maybe not that large. Is that also within the same space? It's not. No. That's in uh, 485 Broadway. Okay. Um, although they use our space at times, they don't have dedicated space. It is it is part of the art history major or concentration, gotcha. as Harvard calls it. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a track within the art history program. And it's a small group of, I think it's about, I don't want, I'm so bad with numbers. I think it's around 30 students okay. a year. It might be around that, Something. and and so, but yeah, they don't have space here Interesting. that's dedicated. They come in with classroom space. And the other thing you had mentioned is that Harvard uh, DSD has always had a strong relationship with practice, and and I can re recall back now when I was uh, probably at undergraduate level, uh, you know, students are talking to. Uh, faculty and older uh, practitioners about what schools I could potentially go to and this or that. Harvard, I do remember always being described as being, if you want to have a practice, you know, and you want to be practicing, then you would go to Harvard as opposed to, let's say, Princeton as an example. And, and of course, without having gone to the school, I was like, I don't really know what that means. And I, I think one interpretation of that uh, might be that, you know, at Harvard, you learn how to I don't know, like the focus is on more of construction details and the things that maybe uh, a, a lower degree person would think of, of what practice entails. I think actually it's not it's not that, in fact. So, yes, I would think like if you hear, oh, Harvard is oriented towards practice, you would think, yeah, it's more pragmatic. Yeah, um, and that's what you're saying. Um, but actually, I think that the tie to practice has been more one of... Um, running a practice and having the ability to lead a practice. And so, I mean, I, I get tired of the word leadership because I think it gets thrown around a little bit too much in academia. But I think that, that, that like when people were saying to you, oh, Harvard is a place where you go if you're interested in practice, I think it's that side of practice that has always been associated with this school. Um, and and so having you know having a voice in in furthering practice um and and leading in off in offices so if you think of um uh, a lot of the significant offices you'll often see that a lot of the principals have a, a gsd degree um for me the distinction of the GSD, if you think of other graduate schools, um, there are a couple things that characterize it. It's this healthy attitude to practice and, and the support 
regarding practice that the school offers. It's always had a really strong career services office that brings in different practitioners, including very alternative um, ideas of practice. And so there's enough there's enough of a infrastructure here to allow for that exposure and and bring in those voices, which I think is really great. I think it's also characterized by the three departments. And so by that exposure to working with urban design and, and planning and also with landscape um, and with advanced research. And so, um, you know, I think that that's quite something for me. One of the things that had, you know, I didn't I didn't go here and I didn't go here deliberately because I wanted to go one Princeton was it was when I went to Princeton, it was a very particular moment where the school had um, very strong figures. You know, Tony Fiddler was there, Alan Colquhoun, Mark Wigley, um, uh, Michael Graves. And it was a very active, energetic environment, Beatrice Colomina. Um, so I, I wanted to go there, but I also thought and believed and profited from a sm very small school, right? Where you can't hide, you're, you're there and you are, you're, you're sort of forced to engage, which I think mm. as an architect, you have to engage. You can't, you can't be a wallflower. You can't be hanging back and ha waiting for someone to tell you what to do. You actually, as you said, it's not an easy field. It's not a very well-paid field. You have to love it and you have to want to be, you want to step up and step in. Hmm. And so I always thought to myself, oh, Harvard's so freaking big. There's, there are too many people who are probably hanging on the edge of the wall, you know, or sort of wallflowers. And, and so that was always my assumption. And then teaching here, I realized, yes, it's very big, but it's actually, it's, it's big because it's made up of so many different programs and components. So in addition to the three departments, you have, the Master of Design Studies, which is mm -hmm. um, advanced research. It's non-studio based. You have the Doctor of Design Studies. You have the PhD. But also, with even within the departments, there are different programs and strains. And so it's a, it's a big school made up of a lot of parts. Mm -hmm. And so not each part is as big as we assume from the outside. And I think that's good. Um, and so uh, and meanwhile, you have the the exposure to all those different parts and you meet people in all those, you know, the students know each other across the programs. And I think that's very, very exciting. So for me, that's what characterizes the, the school. Plus, you have the connection to the other schools at Harvard and some students take advantage of that. Others don't. Yeah, that's interesting. I can see where that would be a very rich environment. And I think your point about maybe getting swallowed up and lost amongst a lot of people is also a good one. But I, I yeah, I, I didn't know from the outside, and you wouldn't know, I suppose, that within the 600 people in the trays, that is actually a, a lot of different types of groups of people that are overlapping. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's um it, it it's very interesting that. And we try the studios on the small side. I I've, I've aspired to keep them down to 10 people. That's hard to pull off. Um mm. and so we haven't always hit that. Our studios tend to be between 10 and 12 people. But um I think that it's important not for them to get too big. That's a pretty good size. I mean, uh, not to name institutions, but I, I know that I, the ideal number is around 10 to 12 for a lot of people, but I've seen and been part of studios that were like 24. That's crazy. <laughs> and that's crazy. Yeah. It's madness. Like, I, I don't understand it from uh, from the teacher's perspective, how you even, even if you're teaching studio 15 hours a week, which is a heavy load, yeah. how do you even, how do you do it? How do you do it? I don't understand. Exactly. No, I think it's it's it, and that's actually always an interesting conversation with the university is getting them to understand that our faculty teach much more than other faculty across the they spend more time with students you know than than faculty across the university. So I'm curious one-on-one -on -one teaching. Yeah, it's it's very time consuming and uh, again from a first person perspective it's it's exhausting <laughs> it's tiring yeah like i don't know how after the 23rd students you know you can even understand what's going on yeah that's but, crazy yeah. and even for the students i mean you can you can't really get very deep in your exchange with yeah. your teacher right yeah exactly exactly no i think you have to keep it small recognizing that 
that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, and then also the studio culture of a smaller group where mm -hmm. it's also the other students. It's small enough that you really rely on that, that group. Hmm. Harvard sounds like an interesting place. I'm semi tempted to <laughs> go back to school. <laughs> Submit my oh, <okay>. application. <laughs> um, it, no, I, it, it, I, I, every day I'm amazed. Right? It's, it is, it is extraordinary. I, I just, I just really like the idea that you would have a focus, but and yet you're surrounded by a bunch of different people that are very different in different studies, but also still tied together by this very very broad thing called architecture okay well if you want to move back east uh, you gotta <laughs> let me know <laughs> yeah, you, guys, you guys should talk this one out <laughs> yeah i think so I'm, I'm curious did did over the years did you notice like very specific trends that students seems to be more and more interested or you mm -hmm. know starting to question more or be intrigued about well absolutely right now i mean i think students led the the desire to expand the curriculum and and recognize that you know structural racism and power imbalances lie within our field and we need to be we need to understand that that needs to be part of an education so that we understand how as we design further how we can engage that um, mm -hmm. i won't say how we can avoid it altogether because i think um i think power and uh cities and buildings do go together in that it's very hard to um in the in the end architecture is expensive and changing architecture is expensive and so rather than say we can avoid power or capital altogether i think you you can't you can't disassociate um the design fields from capital mm -hmm. but how can avoid them being led by capital. And that's where it goes back to my desire to see practice pushed by academia as opposed to you graduate and you enter into practice and you're simply a minion, right? Yeah. So um, so that's one, one change for sure. I think there's you know, one change, and this is going to make me sound like an old fart, but you know, one change is that students are acquiring knowledge through um, the quick screen world that we live in, as opposed to you know spending time in the library and really diving into material in depth. And so I think students are more um, they're more they're exposed to more information horizontally. Hmm. They've also traveled more. You know the world mm -hmm. has become more accessible, um, but they maybe are less adept at being in depth. Mm -hmm. And so I think we were more narrow um, in my generation and earlier, um, but we were, I would say that you really took a little more time with things. And I think time is a precious commodity today. And so um, for me, one of the, one of the things that is really important to introduce into the school and introduce into one's world, even after school. So even you guys are us. Uh, is how do you build time into your world so that you can reflect and and think deeply about things um, as opposed to always feeling like you have to scroll to the next thing because you might be missing out on something. Right. That's a fantastic point. And I, like when we went to school, it was obviously fairly recent and in, in some ways, but it was sort of at the turning point when like laptops were becoming mandatory at that kind of phase and mm -hmm. um i think the difference between deep diving into maybe a, a smaller range of subjects or narrow as you described it versus being kind of scattered across is interesting i do feel like design requires you to be able to get into that zone where you are purely focused on whatever that particular thing might be for x period of time i think it's hard to achieve high quality things that are well crafted crafted in, in terms of the building of it or crafted in terms of like even the concept without having that intense focus? I think so. I, and so I think it is required, but I do worry that that's a very hard thing to, um, to ensure mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're teaching students. And so if you think of, we go back to this point we were talking about earlier of the zero to 60 learning that you get as an architecture student, 
how do you ensure that part of it? Because it seems like you're synthesizing and you're gathering a lot of things. Like if you think of a studio project, it's the intersection of your knowledge of technology, your knowledge of history, your knowledge of, of form and space. Um, and so it seems like it's synthetic and it should be just a sort of gathering of all this information in a way broad. And yet, as you say, it has to be deep as well. And so how do you ensure that the student has the confidence to give that give time for that depth and that has to be conscious i think it has to be um inserted artificially because you can't assume it's going to happen yeah i don't think it's going to happen especially now not with iphones and instagram and all that yeah. stuff <laughs> yeah yeah exactly uh you had also mentioned that the maybe one of the changes in students is their interest in <clears throat> um social issues race issues and all that stuff and um i think that's true it's, it's actually pretty remarkable to see you know, I, I, with the students I see, which are like fourth year undergrad students, come to the table interested in these things from day zero. Like, we don't have to tell them, like, this is important. You have to think about this. They're already coming and saying, I want to learn about this. How does what I do affect these issues? It's like, wow, that's, that's a big question. It's much different from, you, you know, not to poo poo on other things, but like folded origami for the sake of folded origami. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, you know, I think the the world's a difficult place right now. Um, it's a, a hard place to be a young person and be optimistic. Hmm. The, between climate change, social justice, um, economic stresses, and I think students experience all of that directly. And so it's not like they're importing a social interest that is far removed from their own lives. Um, and so they're they're far more aware of these things. And it's it's relevant for them. So it, it, it's not surprising to me. And I, it makes me happy that they realize that because again, that's where I came into being interested in architecture was its intersection yeah. with how we live. And so for me, that seems so obvious, but you're right for, for some people and for a while, um, it's been very removed from, from work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to your kind of career trajectory, I guess we could call it. So um, you, you, you got your PhD and then throughout that time you were teaching. So, um, you know, I didn't work on something that had been built until the very end of my time at OMA. The start of, you know, I was able to see some of the, I worked on the Eurolil project while I was there. And, and then I worked on a lot of competitions and then I helped also with writing but it wasn't until quite late that I saw something built that I had drawn and, um, or helped draw. I'm not gonna take credit uh, there, but, but had helped draw. And, and that's, I think nothing beats that, right? So for me, architecture had remained pretty abstract through my studies at Princeton mm -hmm. and into the beginning of my time at OMA. And at, at that point, um, I think it became quite interesting. And then I, I went back to the more abstract world by starting my PhD, but Ron and I started practicing together. And, and um, I think there is something amazing about um, seeing something on paper or in the computer at this point, and, and then it's translation into something that's really built. And um, there I, I credit for our own work, I credit Ron immensely because um, he has a remarkable patience for dealing with the complexities of that that translation mm. from idea or drawing into reality, and the you know all of the things you have to think about when one surface meets another <laughs> or when one meets another, and and I don't. I, I am I have we have we have discussions about um, about design. I meet with the clients. We we I, I take part in in the design discussions. I don't draw the 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 work. I don't I don't do the the detailing, and that's um, you know partly because I have this job um, here, um, but partly I don't have that same patience that he has, and I really admire and. Uh, and so I, but I, I find that being tethered to the office and to that process of seeing work translated into built work 
is what it, it still really affects my writing and my thinking about design, my thinking about teaching, my thinking about a school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it goes back to what Eisenman had pushed me to do when, when he pushed me to get a, a, an MR instead of a PhD at the, at the beginning there. That's great. That's also really difficult to do. I mean, I, I could be, I say this because I know so many people who, let's say, are around our generation and they are sincerely interested in practice and also interested in teaching. And the conversation that amongst um, a lot of us very often is, I feel like I have to choose one or the other because I don't know how I'm going to manage to do both. And it just occurred to me when you were speaking, um, and this would apply to the two of us because and, I, and my and myself have a practice is well partner with someone <laughs> not that you would choose a, a life partner just for that but i mean that's i guess one way way to do it but it, it is always this weird this conversation of like how do what do i do here because i want to do both but I, I don't feel like i can commit to you know and, and do well in, in both sides yeah i mean i think um i'm constantly feeling like i'm i'm a dilettante in so many different things, mm. right? I feel like I don't have enough time for my writing. I don't have enough time for our practice. I don't have enough time for teaching. I don't have enough time for running a school, um, and and don't have enough time to just you know live. <laughs> yeah, keep abreast of the world around us. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually think it, so. There are times when I think, oh, this is crazy. I need to I need to focus more. It's a little bit. I I realize I'm just continuing my made up major right you know mm. I, I haven't changed since i was an undergraduate but but then i do think that anyone and who's really interested in what they do will probably always feel that way yeah. right that you you always feel like you, there's more you can do and and instead of getting anxious about that sort of revel in the fact that you always like what you're doing and and i think that that's you know that so it's a more positive way of seeing that instead of feeling like you're crushed by never never feeling done with anything yeah uh, feeling like you're always fueled by the fact that there's more to do is a better way of looking at it oh i like that i'm okay, personally good. waiting for clones to become available <laughs> that's my my game plan okay. <laughs> 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 no, oh, but I, I I totally understand what what you know what you mean, and it's it's hard too when you when you are passionate about having multiple interests and not have to pick and choose and just focus on one. You know, it's it's very difficult to feel satisfied when you have you yeah. know a million things going on. But at the same time, you're you're never bored. Yeah. Yeah, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> never bored because there's we're too tired to be bored. <laughs> I, that. I I do I have told the students that. Um, sleep is a premium, which is something I didn't believe when I was a student. Yeah. Um, but I, I believe more and more. I, you know, that's one of those things that I, I feel like there's a list of maybe five items that are really difficult to convey to students, um, depending on the level that they're at. And that might be the top one, which is sleep is important. It's something that I definitely did not do in school at all. And now I'm yeah. always preaching the opposite, which is kind of weird. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. It's another area where students, I think, have changed. Um, students are coming in more aware of the the value of of balancing their lives mm. more, mm -hmm. um, and and um, don't. I mean, I, I I I I was so unhealthy when I was a student <laughs> in terms of. I mean, I, I so enjoyed being in school that and spent so much time talking to other people because I think that's in the end, that's part of the problem of architecture school. It's not that you're always working all the time. It's that you're spending a lot of time with your friends mm -hmm. also. It is a collaborative environment and that's that's incredibly fun, but you can spend a lot of time, waste a lot of time <laughs> doing that. And I think students are now more aware of the the need to be. I mean, they eat much better than oh, yeah. I did as a kid as a student, and they are they value things more. And I I think that's great. Um, so I I think that that has changed. I think that's totally true. I, I like some of the students I've seen more recently. They're eating acai bowls, uh, which actually aren't particularly healthy. But you know, whatever grains and green juice, vegetable, cold press, this and that. I'm like, what? <laughs> it was like canned chili. What I was, what I. Ate. <laughs> exactly. So I, I'm so on that. I'm curious. So you were saying it was unhealthy. Like, was it the diet was not healthy when you were a student? What were you eating? Oh, actually, I will confess. I 
I've always loved food and I've always loved cooking. And so, in fact, I at Princeton, I lived off campus with, uh, I was in a house of uh, boys and me, and we, one of us cooked dinner every night. One of, we were all in architecture, except for one guy who was in political science. And we, he would do themed dinners that were like Chiang Kai-shek chicken. Um, and I was, I think I cooked on Thursdays. And by that time we hadn't had many vegetables. So I think I, I ended up cooking mainly vegetables <laughs> at that point. I wasn't vegetarian, but it was sort of like, okay, guys, we got to get some vegetables. <laughs> Um, but but no, I I think um, I've I've actually always always loved food. Talking about your role as dean, uh, you were dean at Rice for quite a number of years, like nine and a half, yeah. I think you mentioned, right? Yeah. And yeah. you're dean at the GSD now. I'm curious, what is that position like for? I mean, these those are both obviously major institutions, and the GSD is a big school, meaning like a lot of people. What is your daily role like, and what do you do in maybe in comparison to, let's say, a teacher who's teaching a studio? Oh, well, I mean, that's a, yeah. Um, so if you're teaching a studio, you're focused on that studio. You come in and you teach your 15 hours or whatever it is per week, uh, 12 hours to 15, depending on where you are in the curriculum or what school. And And I think all faculty have then additional service components that they you know, where they're on committees, where they help with the what I call the collective project of the school, because a school is is you know a faculty faculty aren't just focused on their own class; they're also focused on how their class fits within the curriculum and how the whole school operates. They're all they're the leadership of the school, right? The the faculty. Um, help determine things. The faculty admit the students, the faculty determine the curriculum. And so the the faculty are working on this collective project. And my role, in a way, actually, maybe the, the best comparison is, in a funny way, with the, the I, I lead the faculty in the way that a faculty member might lead a studio, right? So I, I sort of, you know, shepherd the, the faculty and make sure they have what they need to do their work. Um, and so that means, making sure they're placed correctly, that they um, know what opportunities mm -hmm. they have, that they um, uh, that they can contribute to this shared project. And so it's it's a lot of the role is is essentially shepherding or you could say it, it compares really well to editing. Mm. Right. It, I see it very much like editing where you're your my job is to make them look good right to to help them be as good as they can be um and then so there's part of the school part of my job is focused on the faculty in that way and then part of my job is focused on um the the larger mechanism of the school and how the pieces go together um and then the outward face of the school so um, speaking to our alumni or speaking to possible donors or speaking to um anyone who wants to hear anything about the GSD. So, you know, making sure that we have a public role and a public face. And, mm -hmm. and since I'm very interested in this engagement with the public, that side of the school is very interesting to me in terms of ensuring that we communicate in such a way that the public understands us. Because everyone, everyone out there, you know, I point to the street outside, everyone lives in architecture. And we, we affect everyone, right? And so it it really helps us if we can communicate with everyone and also explain to everyone why architecture is so amazing and what it can do to make your world better mm. and why it is you know why it takes time why it takes money why it makes noise when it's being constructed um why why it should happen and so that that part i think is um you know, the, in a way, I, I wanted to be an architecture critic of a newspaper, and it's a, a similar role as ensuring that that we help the public understand why this is important. That's a super good point, um, because I've always thought, I think it's interesting, from maybe, maybe from a student's perspective, the dean of whatever school you're at, you, you know their name, you might know of them also because of, of some works they did or some things they wrote in the past. But apart from that, it's this kind of elusive position that a lot of students are like, I don't really know what they do. They're at the very top. I, they give speeches every now and then. But the communication <laughs> uh, part that you uh, 
mentioned is so critical and it actually touches on i mean that applies to the entire profession of architecture in general because i do feel like a lot of folks don't the folks on the street <laughs> don't really understand exactly what it is architects do or even understand like the value of architecture definitely don't and there's no reason they should mm -hmm. um but but it, it but we should try and change that mm -hmm. because it, it's great if they do it's great you know imagine what that does for our field if if more people understand what we do yeah and if you think, so you know um kindergartners are are working with robotics today right the stem education has transformed k through 12 education and so engineering is not foreign to a seven-year-old in a way right and and architecture hasn't done that and i think that's a huge disadvantage so um, part of what we're doing is building out an early design education component to the school. So we've always had the design discovery program. It used to be called Career Discovery, which was a summer summer program for people who were interested in learning whether they want to go to architecture school. So you mm. you do a six week project or a six week program, and we're expanding that to more and more attention to how you. Um, reach out to a broader audience of younger people to expose them to what architecture is. Um, and that also is ma married to our undergraduate program. So how can how can our students be a little, our MARC students be a little more involved with the undergraduates to help them see what, what architecture means? And so um, I, I think if we can expose our students to talking to others about the importance of architecture they benefit in learning how to speak to a public audience or a broader audience and we all benefit by exposing really smart undergraduates at harvard and and ideally younger kids too if we can expand our programs um to outreach um to what this field is yeah, yeah you know we were talking about um last time we were driving with david we we were noticing that it's funny no one ever advertised like any architecture <laughs> offices ever advertised their services right like you right. see advertisement billboards for iphone or like speed dating apps or like, you know <laughs> everything right but yeah, architecture yeah. somehow is not something that's being put on the radar of people and mm. it's almost like i don't know either it's a very very introverted profession in a way or maybe it's almost a, a taboo that we're i don't know it, we're, do we're not supposed to advertise what we do and, and I, I don't really know where that would come from but there's uh, i think it's actually a, a, a simpler answer unfortunately i think there isn't enough economic return for the cost of mm. advertising so an iphone you put up that big billboard they're really nice right now with the photographs of the animals that people have taken with their <laughs> iphone oh yeah yeah so that campaign um but that pays off because you sell how many iphones whereas an architect doesn't do you know thousands millions i don't know how many iphones get sold in a day right um uh, so it's just the scale i think doesn't permit it to be something that um, advertising works well with in that way yeah you're probably right if i win the lottery i'm gonna spend half of that money on architects <laughs> random architecture advertisements <laughs> i love that <laughs> So part of part of what I looked at with my dissertation was um, there were companies in that during the war developed materials that they then wanted to be used more uh, at, once the wartime effort was done they wanted their materials still to be used so like U.S. gypsum was developed um, you know they they were used during the war and they wanted to expand their field so they have a series of ads in architectural forum where they essentially paid architects to do speculative projects so it was it spread in the magazine this was in like 1943 if you look at architectural forum issues every month had a, a, pre a spread by an architect with a project that was just a a, a drawn project um, using their material so us gypsum did this revere copper and brass did this other companies did this and so you can see material materials advertising like mm. that and using architecture but it, you don't see architects advertising. You're right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, on the subject of communicating architecture, I am because I certainly see uh, a parallel between your role as dean and conveying um, the value of your school and of, and the value of architecture to, uh, let's say, uh, folks who might be for fundraising purposes. Let's say uh, that seems very parallel to an architecture practice and a partner of office having to talk to a potential client and convincing them, pay us more money than the next guy or pay us whatever fee to do this for you. Yeah. And so I suppose my question is, what is it you say to convey the value of architecture to someone or to convince them that, you know, this is a worthwhile thing for us to be spending money and time on? I think if you believe in the project that you're designing, um, or if you believe in a component of the school that you're trying to raise money for, it's much, it's, it's quite, actually not hard because you're not, you're not selling snake oil. You're not, you know, I think the, the challenge, and I've talked about this before, the challenge is that you are selling something that isn't tangible yet, right? That's not, you're, you're, you're selling something that speculatively that someone has to invest in and then it gets built. And that's a big thing to invest in, right? It's, it's not like a car where if you, so Ron and I got a car when we were in Houston, I don't drive a lot and, and it was a big Volvo SUV and I didn't like driving it. It was just too big. And I also didn't like the idea that we had an SUV. So we got it and very quickly sold it back. Mm. And with a building, people rarely do that, right? You, <laughs> if you commission a building, you're kind of, you got it, right? So, so I, you do have to um, make sure that when you're selling something, whether it's a building or whether it's a program in the school or financial aid, that I'm always raising money for financial aid or for you know endowed professorships. There's things I believe in, right? So um, you have to be sure that the project that you're designing is something that the person will want. You can't you can't sell someone a building that they're not going to like. Mm. You know, so you can't say it. Yeah, yeah, you'll like this. You'll like this, and it's um, completely different than what their tastes are. So you have to be sure that you're really communicating fairly um, and explicitly, but also you have to share the passion that you have and why that is worth investing in literally. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Um, I, I, I think people are drawn to other people who are passionate about what they do. You know, there's some kind of energy. I think it's energy. contagious. Yeah. The what? I think it's contagious. It's contagious, yeah. 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 So do you still find some time and opportunities to write about architecture in all of those yeah. busy days? I do, um, when, especially when I'm forced to by deadlines. So <laughs> you know, I still feel like um, that's, that's unfortunately, I'm, I, that's still how I operate. So uh, yes, I do. I do continue um, trying to write um, when I can. And so right now, for example, um, we've revamped the Harvard Design Magazine, and um, the first issue came out. Mark Lee and Florencia Rodriguez co-edited it, and it was on the topic of the Americas or or America. Uh, the second issue is um, edited by Anita Beres Pieta and Diane Davis, and it's on the topic of the publics. And the third issue that's coming out uh, in the spring is on the topic of um, the global today. And I'm editing that issue with Rahul Mahotra. And that's been such a pleasure actually to work on both um, shaping the content, so figuring out who we want writing for it, but also writing some pieces and doing some interviews. And so um, uh, that's been the most recent thing that I've been spending time on. Um, I'm curious, do you have a sense of what this is another big question, <clears throat> similar to my question about practice earlier. What is the future of architecture? What are the, the key things within the profession that you think are going to be critically you know, important for the profession to look at and investigate? <clears throat> I mean, I think, um, I think using materials intelligently, um, and I don't think, you know, that goes back to uh, the assumption, when you hear that, you think, oh, sustainability and pragmatism mm -hmm. and it sounds like a constraint and actually i think that we're going to enter an exciting period of material research again i think that that that's on an upswing right now in terms of understanding how 
how we can be more intelligent about how we use, um, how we resource materials, how we access materials, how we deploy materials, how we combine materials, and, and how we build differently. So I think that's one thing that will change, and that's a necessary pressure coming out of um, simply environmental concerns mm -hmm. and economic concerns, right? Um, so that's that's one thing I think that that is bound to change. Um, I think so. Part of what attracted Rahul and I to this topic of the global is um, we've obviously had the kind of backlash against global architecture, but I think that's been uh, that's been a kind of superficial backlash and also a kind of dumb backlash because it's it's been a backlash also against form which I think is is not um, shouldn't be thrown out with you, know, you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater form shouldn't be thrown out with mm -hmm. um, accusations of irresponsible global practice because we all have to deal with form and so my hope is that another thing that's on the horizon of practice or our attention in practice is an intelligent conversation about form and space, as opposed to this, we've gone through about a 15 year period where you f you get the sense that if you talk about form, you're characterized as not being socially responsible. Right. right. And I, I, think, I think we're at the end of that backlash. And I think we're at a moment where we can again say, okay, we, we draw lines, we build walls, walls, so create so create insides and outsides. So we create divisions, right? Um, and that's not irresponsible. That's not antisocial. It's just a you know we do create boundaries. And how do you how do you articulate those? And how can those boundaries work in in ways that create better places to live? So I I, I think those would be the two things. That's my prognosis. <laughs> Um, they're, they're both really interesting to so the second one. Do you think some of the, you know, the talking about the backlash uh, in response to these star architects and their kind of era and maybe even the work they did. And you're saying some of that was maybe not totally founded. Um, but you say that because you think people were just tired of seeing the same faces is because their work was too flashy. Like what, what, what part of the backlash was not maybe totally necessary? Part of the backlash that wasn't necessary was uh, against form. Mm -hmm. So, uh, form, you know, we we need we need form. We try we uh, architects traffic in form. So, be, having a backlash against form is is really like you know, ca cutting yourself off at the knees. Right. 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 The part that was justified was um, you know flying people around the globe for doing a building that is very similar to a building that they did somewhere else and and. And yes, having sort of five people be seen as if you want good architecture, you need work by one of those five people in the world. And I think, I think that period is behind us, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, and I don't blame those five people. You know, it's it's um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, they rode a crest, but I don't think they necessarily had lives that were. I, I think at a certain point, it becomes a kind of machine that they couldn't get off of, right? But, yeah. Um, but but I I think that I, I think that is changing. I think that makes sense, and it also ties into I would assume with everyone's uh, generally speaking, everyone's understanding of even sourcing things more locally. Even if we're talking about you know food and materials, like there's a sense of we don't need to again be spending whatever amount of money on fuel flying all over the place when yeah. we can have quality things closer to us. That might be a stretch, but I think that's part of it. It's just being more responsible. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of the upsides to COVID is that we've learned that with Zoom, you can actually invite people in or, or, or have project meetings. You don't have to be on site for everything. You don't need to um, be together for everything. This is actually a format that can work. I'm going to pause for a moment because I have to. Sh there's this moment where the sun just comes <laughs> right in. And um, and so when you were talking about, uh, the, I think the phrase you used was irresponsible global practice. Was that what you were referring to? Yeah. That, okay. that, and, and that's not, you know, it's not an irresponsibility on the part of the practitioner. It's hmm. an irresponsibility on part of the world of, of um, you know, it's just, I, I think, um, 
I think the world is getting better at, at realizing that you don't need, not everyone has to have the same thing. Mm. You know, you don't, so we don't all need to get the same building. We don't all need to be getting the same coat design. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I think a little more, um, appreciation for, uh, a variety of talent. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. I could see that. I mean, my first thought is, and I don't know if this is really related, but even things like Etsy, um, is becomes incredibly popular. You know, the idea you I have a small batch. I think small batch is fine. I don't think I, you know, at the same time, I don't want to swing all the way to fetishizing the small or the local. That's part mm. of what, again, got Rahul and I interested in this topic of the global today. Cause you know, we've gone through history where there's been interest in localism or regionalism and and then interest in global practice. And I think that we want to make sure that we're not, um, uh, it's what we're proposing is not a backlash against the global in favor purely of the local. It's, it's, it's um, understanding what these scales of relationships are today. Yeah, yeah. You know, we were talking to, uh, let's say, a, a pretty well-established architect recently, older, um, had a very illustrious oh, career. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> it's a he, I don't know. <laughs> um, <Is that> but, <laughs> uh, and he was asking us, uh, what was his question? It was like, oh, shoot. His question was um, something like, what is the... What is the next thing? Yeah, what is the next thing in architecture, which we sort of, I guess, just talk about, but <clears throat> it was more like, like I think there were times in architectural history where, where there were these, not even trends, but but uh, shifts or like movements, right? There's isms, modernism, postmodernism, deconstructionism, sure. whatever ism, and I, I suppose another way to think about the question is like, what is the ism of now, or what is the ism we see happening in the next few years, and. I've kind of felt like there's not one big ism that's going to be in the umbrella for everybody. And I don't think that it's going to be the case. Yeah. And there hasn't been for a long time. I, I mean, I would say, so when I was in school at Princeton, that was when decon was pushing against postmodernism. And that's part of what made Princeton itself extremely interesting because it was a battlefield between the two. And so you really got a sense of, hmm people had reasons for wanting one side or the other as super exciting, but that hasn't been the case for a while. Um, you should talk to Bob Somo because he has a very beautiful lecture on itties versus isms. So, you know, postmodernity versus postmodernism. And um, he's, he's so good at, at putting these things, capturing these things in, in the most um, intelligent of ways. There hasn't, there hasn't been, those kind of camps mm. in our field for a long time now. And everyone kept saying, okay, what's the, you know, what's coming after postmodernism? We had the bo blocks, what was it? The boxes and the blobs <laughs> was a while in the nineties, mm. right? When we, mm -hmm. we had essentially the introduction of non-Euclidean geometry through the computer, that was seen as a kind of battle, right? The right angle versus splines and, and curves. Um, and, and I think today you don't have that kind of broad camp. There are style camps that you can see that are, I think, characterized more by representation than by actual design strategies mm. or argument. I think it's, I think the arguments are a little bit um, lacking today. I don't know, you know, for a long time, people said, okay, what's the next thing will come? The next thing will come. And um, I don't know. I don't know if we'll have that kind of collective movement um, anymore. Maybe we will, but um, I'm, I'm no longer saying that's right on the horizon. I mm -hmm. think uh, Ron characterizes the parallel to the late 19th century where you have a, a sort of, a, a kind of eclectic moment in architecture where a lot of different things were going on and there wasn't a co kind of coherence. And I think that we're in a similar moment for a long time when he was making that characterization, we both thought that moment would shift as it did, you know, there, there it did with World War I coming in and sort of ushering in modernism both through 
technology and and through design um i don't know no. how you know i can i i have no prognosis but i i think it's very useful to assess the moment and recognize the risks of believing that representational styles um are sufficient because i don't think they are uh, sufficient um sufficient in what sense they aren't they aren't, they aren't um they aren't movements right. or they aren't right. they aren't arguments they aren't um they aren't ideas they are um appearances right so um you know i worry sometimes that they stand in for or they they're seen as as ideas or arguments and i think right now they're appearances yeah you know on that that last note i've i've had this kind of theory for a while that part of the reason why that is happening has increased i think is because images are so easily shared that it yeah. kind of, it infiltrates everyone's minds and if we're all drawn to nat naturally to a graphic we like and we find ourselves kind of role playing through that which i don't i don't uh I, i'm not saying that's not a good thing to do at times as an exercise but it can kind of yeah filter into the work maybe too much or stand as a kind of fake replacement for an idea or whatever you might call it absolutely their images are so easily shared and they're also so easily made mm. yeah, it's, it's a lot easier to make an image than it is to to make a building they're, they're also easier thing to consume, right? Because yeah. you're really just ab absorbing it visually. You don't mm -hmm. really have to actually use your brain to digest it. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. The the question of isms and what you said, I, I think, is great. Um, it seems like, for sure, one of the focuses is going back to what you had said about what you see students interested in, which is, um, you know, the kind of social crisis or crises that we're involved with and involving the race and also obviously the environment. And um, this is obviously kind of guessing, but if those two things, um, the social crises and then the environmental one, become, you know, the main core issue that architecture wrestles with, it's kind of interesting because maybe those issues are never going to go away, not in the short term at least. It's not going to be like deconstructivism or blobism goes away because we've now evolved to a different tectonic kind of trend. Like social issues will probably be present for a long time, as will environmental ones. Yeah, I mean, someone, so someone would argue that um, in the 60s, they were very present as well, mm, right? So yeah. I think it's very... And I think that parallel would be interesting to mine further to um, understand both this, the 60s were a moment when I think architectural design was disregarded in favor of architectural activism. Mm. And I think the same thing is happening a little bit today. And instead of marshalling design towards activism, which I think is harder to do because it's, it's very hard to um, find the connections that uh, between you know how we how do you make the world a better and more just place through design it's it's hard work um it's easier to um demonstrate as uh figures in a crowd than it is to redesign public space and that's it's the latter work that we have to do um but i think that you know i i i love your optimism that these issues will stay around but these issues were very present, both environmental issues and social issues were very present in the 60s. And yeah. so I actually think we have to be pretty cautious that they don't disappear again. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, the, the last thing with this, because we're going through our time, do you have a favorite building? Oh my God, that's a hard question. <laughs> it's the hardest question of the interview. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. Um, depends on the day. Um, <laughs> It's a Friday. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's November twenty twenty one. Um, I'm I'm very fond of the Inland Steel Building in Chicago um, by S O M. Uh, in that, uh, I I think that um, it's so it's a building with its structure on the outside and then an open plan. But I think it's also an incredibly beautiful building in terms of the stainless steel and the relationship of the stainless steel and the glass. Um, and I think I have a propensity to like buildings of that scale. So the other building I'll name is the Menil Institute in Houston, 
which has always fascinated me for being um, a building that sometimes seems really big and at other times seems really intimate. And uh, Inland Steel is a little bit the same thing. I, there are these buildings at that scale, which is a kind of middle scale that I think play a very important and interesting role in a, in a city. So the Menil does it through its institutional uh, program. It's a fantastic museum. I mean, it's a remarkable collection, but it's also, it, it, I think it's Piano's best building. It's a fantastic building in a neighborhood in Houston. And Inland Steel is, is um, I think it's on LaSalle Street in the Loop in, in Chicago. And so it's embedded within the, the city, but it changes the fabric of the city, even though it's it's a corner building hmm. in a in a dense city, and it it's it's not an object building. I mean, it, you could say it's an object building because it's such a beautiful jewel. But I think both of those buildings play a role, play with scale, play a role in their context, and are very very beautifully designed, um, formally and spatially and materially. So, um, and I'll do a little shout out to uh, Barkley and Sharon Johnson, who did the Drawing Institute at the Menil and managed to do, I think it's very, very hard to do a building on a campus with such a jewel of the building as the Menil. And the Drawing Institute um, did a fantastic job of, of introducing a second building on that campus that does very much the same thing. Awesome. But two more structures we have to investigate and look at on our <laughs> world architecture tour as we're making a giant list. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This the two hours went by super, super fast. Uh, we really yeah. appreciate it. No, it was great. Your questions were really good. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this week's episode of The Second Studio. And thanks to Sarah for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure having her on the show. If you like this episode, then please support our show by leaving us a review in the Apple Podcast app. That's a great way to support our show. If you don't know how to do that, oh, come on. Just go you, to our website, actually. We have a, a tab that says how to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's not that complicated, not that but way. sometimes, you know, it could be an obstacle. We are also on YouTube. All of the interviews that have videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. We have a website. It's secondstudiopod.com. All of the episodes are on there. And, of course, you can also find us on Spotify, Spotify or any other podcast platform mm -hmm. pretty much um, we are on social media Facebook Twitter and Instagram you can DM you can also text us or leave a voicemail with the hotline 213-222-6950 yep and on Instagram and we post uh, video clips and other stuff like that so you should subscribe All right. alright anything else that's it that's it more fun stuff coming up stay exciting tuned exciting things yeah exciting things exciting things and it's, it's Christmas soon Christmas. Or uh, whatever holiday you celebrate. Christmas, yeah. Hanukkah, whatever, whatever it is in your yeah. country, in your culture. Santa Day. No, wait, wait, wait. This <laughs> Christmas still. <laughs> All right, guys. There, take care. Is, yeah, well, okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.